Jason here with Rich Franklin at MMA World Academy uh, in Scarborough. Um, what brings you to Canada? Uh, came up here to do the seminar, just hang out at the school for a little while, you know, just chilling. Yeah, how'd the seminars go? It went really well. The first one was, I think, a little too early. Okay. And uh, we, you know, had maybe less than a dozen people here, maybe ten people, but the, the second session uh, really, really, really well. It's always, it's always crazy when you walk in and do the seminars because there's such a a variance in, in skill level that you on the fly almost have to adjust what you're doing. Yeah, absolutely. How was the skill level like around here? Was it? We had we had some guys who were uh, adept at what we were doing, and, and guys that really maybe like their first time on on the mat. So you just you have to be able to have part of your group move along and progress, while the other part you keep working the things that they need to work. Yeah, you don't want anybody to get hurt either, right? Yeah. Well, you know, my my seminars are all about learning anyway. Um, I'm not one that says, uh, I was, I said I made a comment at the beginning of my seminar, I went to a seminar one time where they had us running around the, the mat for 45 minutes, it seemed okay. like, and I just thought to myself, I didn't pay a good chunk of change to learn how to run mat, around the mat, you know, so I'm always about getting people warmed up and getting them going right away, light techniques, and, and you're there to learn, and if you can walk away from a seminar with a couple good nuggets of information, then it's money well spent. Right. Well, you're uh, very well-rounded uh, in martial arts as well, but uh, you're also really well known for your conditioning. And did you do any conditioning stuff with these people, or kind of give them any ideas about what you do in your conditioning? No, uh, you know, I, I'll ask. I, I tell everybody to ask questions at the end, and, and I probably should incorporate like a little sit-down session of like, what kind of training questions do you guys have? Because the moment when you say anybody have any questions, they're thinking about the techniques, and then when you sit down, it's like anybody want to ask me a question, they're going to start asking like questions about the UFC, funny stories. They don't think about that training aspect of things. So I should should probably incorporate that. It's a good idea. Thanks for, for giving me that. Yeah, you take that with you. Today. Yeah, there you go. Um, I got something from you today. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, now uh, you got a fight coming up, UFC 148 with Kung Lee. Yes. Okay. Um, now Kung Lee is an interesting opponent. There's not a lot of guys out there like him. He throws very unique combinations. Oh, He's got a very unique style. Um, how do you feel uh, you match up with him? And how do you think, without giving away too much, the yeah. fight will go? I think I match up well. He do, he does pose a lot of problems, and you're right. It's going to be the, the trick for this fight is finding somebody who can mimic his style. The proper the proper training partner is the key to winning this thing. So uh, we'll get on that. I've already started kind of searching that out and seeing what my options are. Um, but yeah, he's he's very unorthodox with his stand up, and that that's going to create the problem. So my my goal, I guess, the key to winning the fight for me is just not stand in his kicking range. And I I fought I fought Chuck. Chuck broke my arm with a kick. Kung's done the same thing to Frank Shamrock, and I just need to not stand in that that, that kicking range. I need to either use my distancing to either elongate or close the distance, one or the other, but not be there. And I'm sure that when we get into the, the camp breakdown, that's basically what we're going to be doing. Yeah, and his, and his one of his most powerful techniques isn't really a round kick. It's more of a spinning kick. He kicks like a mule, you know. Yeah. He, he really kicks right through you. Yeah. And he's hurt a lot of guys with that, so that's one another reason to stay out of that range. And the, the thing about that kick is that anytime somebody spins, you kind of what happens a lot of times you get frozen. You get frozen in the in the moment. And when you pause, oftentimes you have trouble identifying what's coming. You don't know if it's a spinning back fist or a spinning like heel kick or a mule kick or, or whatever's coming. So it's really difficult to identify those things. And Kong does a good job of chambering his legs, so you really don't know where it's coming. Yeah, yeah. Um, so uh, moving along, you're one of the you're you're well known as being one of the nicest guys in MMA. You represent the sport really well. You know, as the sport was going through probably the biggest expansion that it had so far. You know, you were one of the champions, uh, and and you've continued to have big fights and get big wins. Um, but uh, you know, with you being one of the guys who who is easy to market, you you speak very well. You can go out and do a lot of interviews and stuff. Um, does it kind of bother you when people compare the sport with WWE using examples? Examples of guys who like trash talk a lot and kind of um, might give MMA fighters a less of a, a, a good um, image. Yeah, you know, I'll, well, I'll just say people have to realize, like, if you meet any of the, I, I don't want to talk bad about the WWE because those guys, first of all, in the WWE, you're not a fighter, but you are an athlete, and those guys are legit athletes. Um, and so people have to realize they're there for entertainment. These guys get out and they say stupid things and, and all this kind of stuff. And that's that's what they're they're paid to. You're paid to be a bad guy. You're paid to say dumb things. You're paid to create a storyline. And what people don't realize is that after the after the wrestling match.
relax. Those guys are back in the locker room and they're chuckling it up and they're having a beer together later that night or whatever it is that they're doing. And in MMA, you know, you'll get some guys that, that'll talk trash and stuff like that. And you know, when you when you have a genuine dislike for somebody and you want to build a fight, great, more power to you. But when you know, you're just you're out there trying to talk trash like a, like a WWE person just to talk trash or whatever. It's, sometimes it can bring a bad light on the sport, and we've done as much as we possibly can to get the sport to where it is. I think at this point in time, really, the trash talking that one particular individual does isn't going to matter one way or the other because the sport speaks for itself. It's safety record. Overall, you see guys that are talking trash. Uh, you know, one, one of the biggest trash talkers, Chael Sonnen, but he's a great sportsman. Mm-hmm. You know, he'll be one that'll run his mouth the whole time leading up to a fight. But when the fight's over, it's all about the hugs and good job and all that kind of stuff and, until the next fight again. Do you think that sells more fights with the average MMA fan nowadays uh, as opposed to two guys who are very respectful and cordial to each other? I don't know. I think it depends on the fighter sometimes. I think uh, I've, we've, I've always done a good job with my pay-per-views and whatnot. I think my pay-per-views sell, and I think people know that... With me, it's kind of like buying buying something, and you know that you're you're getting a good product before, before you buy it, based on the product's reputation. People know that when they buy a fight, when they buy a Rich Franklin fight, that when they buy one of my fights, that it's going to be an exciting fight because I put myself out there. Win or lose, I put myself out there. It's going to be exciting. Um, but there is something to say, you know. Sometimes I see fighters when they're squaring off at the weigh-ins, and one fighter pushes another. I even have the tendency to be like, oh, I want to see that fight. Yeah. It's not going to make the fight any better. They were going to come out and fight their hearts out anyway, regardless, but for whatever reason, it does, you know, and I think I think if everybody was the quote-unquote nice guy, then it may, it may be a little boring, so you kind of need that full spectrum. Sure. Yeah, yeah. Um, now, you mentioned Chael Sonnen. and uh, he's a, kind of a hot topic these days. Obviously, he's fighting for a title, so, uh, you know, he's got a lot of attention on himself, and he brings a lot of attention on himself. Um, one of the things that he said that uh, is my probably my favorite quote from him is that uh, he's like a bomb, and when he goes off, every Everybody around him gets dirty, yeah. and uh, one of the things he's been saying uh, from time to time when he's trying to get into Anderson Silva's head is he says that um, Anderson uh, beat a math teacher to get the title shot. Now, yeah. um, you know, I find that might be a bit disrespectful. Does that bother you at all? Or? Yeah. Thank you. 
lot. They're talking about five hundred sites. That would be a great thing. here, maybe 10 people, but the, the second session, really, really, really well. It's always it's always crazy when you walk in and do the seminars because there's such a, a, a variance in, in skill level that you on the fly almost have to adjust what you're doing. Yeah, absolutely. How was the skill level like around here, was it? We had, we had some guys who were uh, adept at what we were doing and, and guys 
that really maybe like their first time on on the mat. So you just you incorporate like a little sit down session of like what kind of training questions do you guys have? Because the moment when you say anybody have any questions, they're thinking about the techniques, and then when you sit down, it's like anybody want to ask me a question, they're gonna start asking like questions about the UFC, funny stories. They don't think about that training aspect of things. So I should should probably incorporate that. It was a good idea. Thanks for, for giving me that. Yeah, you take that with you. Today. Yeah, there you go. Um, I'm from you today. <laughs> exactly. Uh, now uh, you got a fight coming about getting people warmed up and getting them going right away, light techniques, and and you're there to learn. And if you can walk away from a seminar with a couple good nuggets of information, then it's money well spent. Right on. Well, you're uh, very well rounded uh, in martial arts as well, but uh, you're also really well known for your conditioning. And did you do any conditioning stuff with these people, or kind of give them any ideas about what you do in your conditioning? No, uh, you know, I, I'll ask. I, I tell everybody to ask questions at the end, and, and I probably should you have to be able to have part of your group move along and progress while the other part you keep working the things that they need to work. Yeah, you don't want anybody to get hurt either, right? Yeah, well, you know, my, my seminars are all about learning anyway. Um, I'm not one that says, uh, I was, I said I made a comment at the beginning of my seminar, I went to a seminar one time where they had us running around the, the mat for 45 minutes, it seemed okay. like, and I just thought to myself, I didn't pay a good chunk of change to learn how to run a mat, around the mat, you know, so I'm always... here with Rich Franklin at MMA World Academy uh, in Scarborough. Um, what brings you to Canada? Uh, came up here to do the seminar, just hang out at the school for a little while, you know, just chilling. Yeah, how'd the seminars go? It went really well. The first one was, I think, a little too early. Okay. And uh, we, you know, had maybe less than a dozen